How are we all doing today? Okay, so um, welcome. Uh, this is, um, I'm sure we're going to get a few more people kind of trickling in, but I do think it's important to, to kind of start our mind. I also have another consideration, another issue, um, and that is that, before, I think before, no, after this, this evening was scheduled, um, I, I, uh, I wound up committing to going to a uh, development and dinner committee, and let me just use this as an opportunity to say that the dinner, the BPY dinner is on Motzei Shabbat, February 23rd, Yay, come to the dinner. Um, and uh, so, but if anything happens and you need me, I'll be in the conference room in my office um, with the development co committee working on, uh, on dinner stuff. So I, I'm, I'm opening up the program tonight and I hope to be back at the closing of the program. Uh, I'm gonna just very, very, very briefly tell you two very quick stories. Uh, both are true stories. Uh, the other day, actually, I got a chance to speak to some of the students in the middle school um, daily, uh, or almost daily, as part of the Yun Tfila. And we were talking about a, a, a couple of different things, and I, I wanted to bring in an example of something that happened to me. Um, in 1990, I was working on my doctoral dissertation, and I needed a book. And uh, the book that I needed was available after extensive, extensive research. The book that, that, that I needed was available only, locally, only in, a, in an Arabic bookstore in Patterson. Um, and I got a friend to go along with me, got my, uh, put on a Yankees cap and, uh, and went to go, uh, to go buy this book. And one of the students raised our hand and said, why didn't you just order it on Amazon? And I said, guys, this was, 1990. There was no Amazon. There was no internet. There was, I mean, there may have been, but it wasn't, you know, re regularly available for everybody. And that caused a, like a big pause in the room. And the people were were amazed. What, what what does that even mean that there was no internet? What does it mean that there was no Amazon? Story number one. Story number two. Um, I, I've seen this on TV. What I'm about to describe is I've seen on TV. I never thought that I would ever actually get to experience it, but I did. Um, not BPY kids. This is what I'm about to describe is not BPY kids. I, I walked into it was a, kind of like a, a shul, a synagogue youth group, and uh, during the week, not, not over Shabbat, obviously. And I walked into uh, to a room and I and I saw like a bunch of kids on their phones texting, and. Um, I, uh, I said to one of the kids who I knew, you know, I said, uh, wow, you know, and he was going at it, you know, like, uh, I said, who are you, you texting? <laughs> yeah, it was somebody sitting like two seats down. <laughs> I, I, you know, I saw, I saw that on a, on a sitcom once, you know, but um, apparently it happens actually in, in real life. Um, so um, technology brings with it a tremendous amount of opportunity. And it also brings with it a tremendous amount of challenge. And um, we're going to be hearing tonight, I'll, I'll be more accurate, you're going to be hearing tonight uh, very fully about, um, about the, the balance of the opportunity and the challenge. Um, and I thank you for coming. I thank you for being partners with us in your children's education. And this is a very, very important part of the upbringing of the raising you know, of our children, taking advantage of the opportunities and seeing what we can do to really confront, head on to confront the challenges and not sweep anything under the rug, but really be responsible with it. Um, I want to thank Naomi Marin for, and, and Dr. Talia Hinden for, um, for organizing this and really taking a, a lead role, and Effie. Um, th th there, there are many, many people who are very, very concerned daily um, and care very much about the experience that your children have. Uh, particularly with regard to this issue. So at this point, it's my pleasure to introduce Mrs. Marin, who's going to introduce the program for the evening. Enjoy. Hi, everybody. So the reason we decided to have this evening is we spent a lot of time with our students. Um, Dr. Taya Epi and I really worked 
trying to figure out what exactly do we need to do to help prepare them to use the technology that we provide them with and the technology that they have at home. Um, we've had many discussions during advisories as topics come up. We've had discussions as well based on those topics. Um, and we felt that one of the most important pieces, besides whatever we do in school, is the home piece. Um, and I was very lucky to hear Dr. Ellie Shapiro, who I'm going to introduce in one second, um, as a parent. And I thought it was a wonderful opportunity for you to hear, first of all, to get information and also suggestions, ideas, answer questions that you may have. Because as parents now, it's much different, I think, than when we were growing up and what our parents had to deal with, even though there were different types of questions and issues that they were concerned with. Um, so this is something I hope will be helpful and will be a, will be a beginning of a conversation, not the entire conversation. Um, so I would like to give you the time. So I'd like to introduce Dr. Ellie Shapiro. He's a New York State licensed clinical social worker and school social worker with a doctorate in education. Dr. Shapiro has been working in New York area, Yeshiva, for nearly 20 years, both in the classroom and in student support. He's a noted writer and sought after lecturer and consultant on child, family, and community matters. And I am very honored to welcome him to BC Live. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, really, uh, really excited to be here. Uh, is this too loud? Is it good? We have some major donor seats right up front. <laughs> um, thank you. And also, I just want to say, everybody's yeah, on the room so we can talk about it. Um, he really is, uh, his reputation is really spreads far and wide. I'm not surprised that he's in a development meeting because he really has an understanding business-wise, education-wise. Uh, he's really someone that people look up to in, in the field of education. So it is a thrill for me to be here. Uh, I'm excited about it. Um, also, uh, my, my first cousin, uh, Nessie Maka, is here. Um, Capture the moment. Smile. <laughs> <laughs> Can everyone squeeze that a little bit? <laughs> okay. Uh, okay, we'll put that in the family chat. Yeah. So, um, just by a, a raise of hands, how many of you think you're here for an internet safety type? No one. Don't be shy. We're small. Okay, we're gonna, so, what I want you to do is I want you to shift the paradigm. Because we tend to think about internet safety, and internet safety is really about content. And what we want to speak about is more about our relationship and our experience with technology. So it's not just about the internet, it's about technology. Okay, so let's shift that internet paradigm. We've heard a lot, the internet's a scary place, the content's dangerous, and that, that is true. Uh, but it's a lot larger of an issue, and that's really what we're going to talk about tonight. By raise of hands, how many of you experience what we call phantom vibrations? And that's when your body's vibrating when your phone's not around. <laughs> So most of you. It's, it's a remarkable thing. Our, our relationship with technology is so enmeshed, we literally do not know where our bodies end and the technology begins. That's the relationship we have. We have computers, cell phones, smartphones, gaming devices, smartwatches. Who has a, a smartwatch here? Right. Just the tech guys. Okay. <laughs> I don't have one. I've always wanted one. If you, you, know, if you want to buy me a gift for Valentine's Day. I um, but we are so enmeshed, the technology we have is so part of our lives, it's integrated in so many ways, uh, to the point where, you shouldn't feel alone, 89% of people experience what we call phantom vibrations. And that's what the world we live in today. These devices, I didn't even talk about Alexa and, and Siri and, and our interactions, it's all a relationship. We have these relationships with technology. The question is, is it a healthy one? or is it an unhealthy one? I like Rabbi Zucker said, the, the opportunity that technology presents and the challenges that it presents. So that's what we're gonna focus on tonight. It really presents a, a ton of opportunity, but also in order for us to maximize the opportunity that it presents, we need to understand the challenges as well. So I have something called the Digital Citizenship Project. I often get asked, what is digital citizenship? I actually started it when uh, Obama was president, so people thought it was a, uh, a, a approach towards citizenship online. You can apply uh, to become a US citizen online. That's not what it is. Digital citizenship are the norms of appropriate and responsible behavior when it comes to technology. The norms of appropriate and responsible behavior when it comes to technology. So, what are the norms? What is appropriate? What is responsible? What is a healthy relationship with technology? So if I were to ask you, you know, you bring a speaker in, the school goes out of their way, they did a great flyer. I don't know who did the flyer, but it was really good. Um, they did a great flyer, they, they, they promoted the event, uh, and then the speaker comes and he goes and takes a selfie uh, at the start of his lecture. Would you say that's appropriate? No. But you don't have to jump, you have to think about it. Process that. <laughs> don't, don't jump on it. 
you know, is it responsible? You know, we can debate it. Some people think it's great, some people not. Um, I was recently at a family wedding where um, the brother of the bride was walking down the aisle. It's a very serious moment here, it's a wedding, right? Um, walking down the aisle, all of a sudden, stop, take out the cell phone, and snap the cell phone. Yeah. All right? I'm not making this up. Everything I speak here is the truth. Everything I speak is the truth. So now, I heard some of you groan, like, I don't know, right? But some of you were like, wow, great idea. Why didn't I do that? So when you think about that, what is normal, what is appropriate, what is responsible, I'm not really sure. You know, we can't necessarily define it. We all have different values when it comes to it. And consideration of what other people think is also part of it. Uh, a friend of mine was at a wedding and he did this. Um, he wasn't part of the, uh, the family, he just decided to do that. And um, is that appropriate? What? No? Yes? We, we have disagreement. And just so you don't think I'm cyberbullying anyone here, I have permission from everyone in this picture yeah. to use it. And he is actually very proud to be known as the questionable digital citizenship guy. <laughs> so uh, these are some of the questions we're facing. Uh, and we're facing it for our kids. You know, our kids are the first generation growing up in this technology-drenched world. Uh, but we're the first generation of parents raising them, the first generation of educators uh, applying this degree of technology. And so again, while we have tremendous opportunity, it also presents challenges. And we want to be thoughtful and deliberative in how we approach this. And so some of you may have come out here tonight looking for what I call the magic pill. You're waiting for that one answer for me to tell you, uh, you know, which, what age to get your child a smartphone? Or you know, which filter should I get that will solve all my problems? or uh, what is the exact amount of screen time to the millisecond where my child will benefit from technology but not you know, be harmed by it, right? So the problem is there is no easy answer, there is no magic pill. It's really complicated and each child is different, each family dynamic is different, and qualitatively what our kids are doing online is also different. Clearly, someone playing um, you know, Fortnite eight hours a day is qualitatively different than someone doing coding you know, in developing. There's a different quality to it. So we need to think about that as well. Anytime you see a study that just throws screen time and say, you know, that's great. Well, not all screen time was created equal. So that's something we need to think about as well. The activities our children are engaged in online, school workers, non-school work, etc. So these are some of the thoughts going in. No magic pills, so I apologize uh, if that's what you came for. I like to say that technology really, uh, we live in the best of times and we live in the worst of times. Does that sound familiar to anybody? <laughs> Who wrote that book? Yes. Dickens, excellent. Tale of Two Cities, Charles Dickens says, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. What's the next line? It was the best of times, it was the worst of times, it was the age of wisdom, it was the age of foolishness. Which I really think that if we ever lived in a time that could be described as best of times, worst of times, age of wisdom, age of foolishness, we are really living in that time. Technology offers us tremendous opportunities, accessibility, productivity, information, connectivity. Um, I really, Rabbi Zucker's story about having to find a book in a, in a store. I, I, when I was doing my master's thesis, I needed a book. This was in 99 or so, 2000. I needed a book. The only place that had it was the Hofstra Library. I, I didn't go to Hofstra, so I could go there, I could use the book, but I couldn't take it out. So I, I, that story actually resonates with me. Um, so technology is, is amazing. Um, the connectivity, uh, you know, I really, I really appreciate uh, the connectivity piece now more than ever before. I have a daughter who's in Israel, so I'm here in Israel, and uh, I know what some of you are thinking: How can a guy so young have a daughter in Israel, right? So, moisturizer is, is very helpful. Um, but I really appreciate technology in such a way that I never did before. The ability to, to connect FaceTime, video chat, to see what her experiences are, it's, it's, it's amazing, it's wonderful. But it also presents challenges where she could call me and video me for every nuanced problem that may occur. And then she's not making decisions for, them, for herself. There was a study that they did with the, uh, in the IDF. They found that they were failing to develop new leaders uh, in the IDF. And what they found was that the uh, entry-level soldiers uh, every decision they had to make, they would text their sergeant. They would not make an independent decision. So what does that mean? It means they're not really problem solving their, for themselves, they're not making the mistakes that they can learn from, uh, and they're failing to be more assertive and, 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 and learn from those experiences. And so that presents its own host of problems. So finding that balance 
between the opportunities that technology presents and the challenges that it presents is really critical and it's something that we want to impart to our kids but we first have to know how to do that as parents and I think one of the challenges are since we are the first generation uh, we, we don't feel confident in our own abilities to do that in fact only 39 percent of parents that we've surveyed um, and we've surveyed thousands of parents uh, only 39 percent report feeling confident managing their children's technology and I can tell you of those 39 percent at least half of them should not feel so confident in managing their children's technology so it's the best of times but it's also the worst of times Technology impacts social, psychological, behavioral, and day-to-day -day functioning, and we're gonna focus on these areas to get a better understanding of it and have that inform uh, some of the practices that we have in our own home when it comes to technology. The truth is, uh, I, like you, love technology. Or is it just me? <laughs> we love technology, it's great. In fact, the UN did a study uh, a few years back and they found that six billion out of the world, seven billion people owned a mobile phone, but only four and a half billion had a toilet. <laughs> When you think about the priorities, right? So I do get pushed back from some audiences. They say, well, what do you do on a toilet if you don't have a phone? I mean, it's, it's a fair, fair argument. But clearly, uh, from a prioritization standpoint, um, you know, technology is, is part of our lives. We also have a generational disconnect. Our kids seem to know more about technology than we do. You ever get that feeling? Unless you're a computer programmer. Yeah? Yeah. The kids, they just seem to know. Um, I like this text between the mother and, and son. Uh, your great aunt just passed away, LOL. Why is that funny? It's not funny, David, what do you mean? Mom, LOL means laughing out loud. Oh my goodness, I sent that to everyone. I thought it meant lots of love. <laughs> <laughs> you could laugh. Uh, and that is real, that is real. And we've all been there, like, you know, we're laughing, but we've all been there where we didn't quite get the lingo. Like our kids are saying something, some abbreviation. I have to look it up sometimes. Um, everybody knows what FOMO is? Yeah. Fear, yes. Fear. Excellent. Good. Okay. So you're bilingual as far as I'm concerned. Um, fear of missing out. Oh, um, yeah. That's a big issue for kids today. It probably drives a lot of the issues with technology. Uh, but don't feel bad if you don't if you're not up on the lingo. There are some things that we parents uh, know that our kids don't know. Uh, our kids do not know what this is, <laughs> and uh, they don't know what this is. In Chabad, they tell me it's a pushka. Uh, they definitely don't know the relationship between these two items. I see some of the younger parents here don't know either. <laughs> so uh, you turn to someone who looks a little older than you, though. I'm sure they're happy to explain. So um, first of all, I want to thank you, those of you that filled out surveys in advance. Um, I've been collecting data from all over the United States. So I'm going to share some of the data with you. Um, the uh, the middle school. I'm basically going to share fifth to eighth grade uh, in this uh, in this piece. Um, and the you'll know that if it's uh, if it's data from here because you'll have a logo on the top corner. So 62% uh, of you reported that your kids own a smartphone. Again, that's fifth to eighth grade. What was interesting was that again, this is only those that filled out the survey um, from first through fourth grade. Zero percent of parents reported that their kids own a smartphone. So when we think about a tipping point. Um, it seems that fourth to fifth grade is a big tipping point when it comes to smartphone ownership. I'm not saying that no fourth graders own a smartphone, but of the people that fill that service. 85% um, of the uh, fifth through eighth grade owned an internet capable device, and 45% um, of the younger kids owned an internet capable device. Um, social media, everybody knows what these uh, logos are. Uh, it's Snapchat, uh, Instagram, uh, WhatsApp, and Instagram. These are the three most popular social media apps used by kids today. Um, if they haven't asked you for it yet, they will soon. Um, and uh, what we found was 51% of the kids here were active users of social media uh, in the fifth to eighth grade. In the first through fourth grade, it was 15%. So social media is something that's in our, uh, uh, is uh, something that kids are engaged in here. Gaming, uh, kids seem to like video games today. 81% uh, of kids uh, are active. Uh, users of digital gaming, and 49% uh, of you report your children frequently play video games. Um, I place no judgment on video games. There's actually a lot of research that points to some benefits that gamers have that non-gamers uh, don't have, including uh, collaborative problem-solving skills when it's a, a game that multiple multiplayer, um, drowning out external noise. I'm sure you've experienced that, where you're like screaming their name, and they're, that actually apparently is a skill in the workplace today. Um, multitasking, uh, as well as a strategic planning. 
when it comes to gaming. So these are skills that get developed. Of course, there is a point of diminished returns that uh, eight hours, you're probably not reaping the benefits of the gaming compared to the consequences of playing video games for eight hours. So it's something to think about. The big challenge today for a lot of parents is Fortnite. Um, your kids, either they're either, either playing it or begging you to play it. It's one of those two categories. Um, videos, Netflix, YouTube, etc. I just was sitting with a student, a ninth grader, uh, this past week, and we were discussing her study habits. And um, I just asked her if it was okay, can we open your phone and, and just take a look at your screen time habits? And she was spending 28 hours a week between Netflix and Hulu and one other video, and uh, YouTube. Netflix, Hulu, and YouTube, 28 hours a week. That's like almost a full-time job. I think you get benefits at 31 hours, 28? So yeah, so I mean, when you think about the amount of time she's spending video games uh, with videos, uh, it's no wonder if he's struggling academically. So these are things to think about. Um, uh, of the parents that uh, completed surveys, 92% of you said your kids watch videos um, with 57% reporting frequently. So when you think about that, videos, gaming, uh, certainly take up a lot of time. Um, and these are, the, what I like about data, by the way, I, I, I quote a lot of statistics. Some of my audience say that it's uh, too much with the statistics. Uh, actually, about 72% of people say it's, it's too much with the statistics. But I, I genuinely believe that data should help inform practice, inform what we do. It shouldn't define it, uh, it should inform. Uh, my brother-in-law, for example, uh, when he was expecting his fifth child, he was decorating the nursery in an Asian theme because he read that every fifth child born in America is Asian. So data should inform practice, not define it. I'll give a minute to think in it. Um, all right, so uh, they actually told me the uh, FE mentioned that the Wi-Fi was down, so I'm just going to log in the old-fashioned way, if that's okay. favorite. Um, it brings us back to like, I don't know, 95, 94. You'd get those discs, you know, free 99 hours. AOL was actually the first company that for a, like a monthly fee you had unlimited internet, which is kind of, there are different like uh, moments in technology advancement. AOL was one of them, the iPhone was another. But uh, it's, it's like, it's, it brings us back to a good time. Like, you know, when we'd have to wait like four hours just to get online, none of the phone numbers would work. You'd finally get a phone number, you'd log in, someone would pick up the phone, it would disconnect. Um, and finally, you tell everyone, don't pick up the phone, and, and, uh, and then you get online and there was absolutely nothing to do, um, and that was 1995. So, <clears throat> all right, so let's talk about the impact of domains that we mentioned. Um, we're talking about behavioral, social, psychological, and day-to-day. -day. So these are the uh, core four areas that I think uh, require understanding and helping to manage our children's technology and our own technology. I think you're going to find a lot of the information we talk about is something you're going to connect with as well. It's not only about kids, it's about our own experiences. So um, let's go into behavioral. Uh, the digital realm promotes certain behavioral issues, including dependence, distraction, impulsivity, disinhibition, and sleep. I think dependence and distraction is something that we all can like readily relate to and see in our kids. Um, when it comes to technology, but a couple of areas that are not as focused on are impulsivity and disinhibition. Uh, impulsivity is when I do something without thinking about the consequences. There's something inherent about technology that makes us more likely to do it. Um, when, I was, uh, when I was a kid, if I was upset about something, I was told, you know, write a letter, uh, put it in an envelope, and wait a week to send it to the person. Usually, uh, at that point, it's resolved itself. Uh, that's not what we do today. When we're upset about something, we tweet, we post, we blog, we message, we comment. Um, it's just, we have that power in our hands so we are ready and able to uh, impulsively not think about the consequences of what we send out. But as uh, uh, Spider-Man's uncle said, with great power comes... Oh good, we got comic book fans too. Okay. Yeah, with great power comes great responsibility. Um, and so understanding that technology, the devices we have, make us much more likely to put things out there without thinking about the consequences. 39% of students that we've surveyed admitted to emailing or texting something that they later regretted. Again, that's 39% of students. Not all of them own devices, not all of them are on social media, and not all of them have the awareness that they probably shouldn't have texted or sent something either. So those are things to think about. 
Uh, but we also know that uh, more than half of adults also post things and texting that they later regret. In fact, 22% report doing so weekly. <laughs> So there's something inherent to technology that makes us more impulsive. And one of the goals tonight is to really develop that awareness of how technology is impacting us so we can uh, adapt our behaviors accordingly. So impulsivity is clearly an issue. It's an issue that kids are facing. And it's an issue that oftentimes results in, in consequences when they put things out there, they share a picture. Uh, I just heard a story of a third grader that shared a picture about someone, don't they look funny? Someone sent it to them. They weren't even thinking, they just forwarded it, and it ended up, it was a third grader, and was, uh, the school also had a high school who had a sibling of the person who looks, said looks silly, and then the whole high school wanted to beat this third grader up uh, because they were uh, cyberbullying. So it was an unintentional cyberbullying, but that impulsivity, not thinking through what the consequences might be and how far something you put out there can spread uh, is important to think about. Online disinhibition, uh, psychologist John Soller coined the term the online disinhibition effect. It's when our online behavior is inconsistent with our real life behavior, our real world values. Um, it's something that uh, the Pew Foundation did a study and most kids said, my, fr my friends act differently online than they do in, in face to face. And so there's something about digital technology that medium makes us more likely to do or say something. And we tend to think in terms of pure anonymity. So if I were to use a screen name like um, Carlos Danger, I might misbehave online. Um, but even if I'm using my own email address, which is Ellie at ellieshapiro.com, I'm still more likely to do or say something than I would in a face-to-face -face conversation. There's just something inherent about that. Because I'm not getting that feedback, that direct feedback, um, I'm more likely to do that. And so the truth is, this is not a new concept where anonymity promotes negative behavior. Anyone who took Psych 101 uh, learned about um, Stanley Milgram and Philip Zimbardo. Stanley Milgram did the uh, post-World War II obedience studies with the electric shocks. The, the teacher, the students, one of the most famous uh, psychological studies. Um, and what he found was two things. One, and he found a lot of things, but two things uh, for now. Uh, one was that people tend to be obedient and listen to authority. Uh, and two, that when people were made to be anonymous, they would deliver longer, stronger, even fatal shocks. So there's something about anonymity that promotes negative behavior. So the digital realm, your personal device, your computer, your laptop, your, um, your um, tablet, you're more likely to be impulsive, you're more likely to be uh, um, disinhibited. And so for kids who tend to be a little more impulsive anyway, it really can create, we're giving them a very powerful tool, but it really can create problems if they're not <laughs> educated appropriately and if there's not a high degree of parental oversight into their behaviors with technology. So those are two areas. Another big area that we uh, are finding is sleep. 79% of students sleep with their cell phones or devices within reach. Why do they do that? You can tell me, what do they tell you? They need an alarm clock. There's often a grade chat that may, something really important at three in the morning might happen and if they miss it, you know, it would be the end of their social lives. Uh, so it's important to realize that um, for the alarm clock piece anyway, do they have amazing savings here? Yeah. yeah. Oh, perfect, good. So they sell, it's a little brown box with big red numbers. Um, <laughs> I think it's like 599 or 699. And that serves as a very annoying alarm clock and they're more likely to get out of bed from that. So we actually know that the artificial light from the phones make it harder to fall asleep. You're in bed with a phone, the artificial light makes it harder to fall asleep. The vibrating noises make it more difficult to stay asleep. The FOMO that they're experiencing, um, missing out on something. Also, they're not getting that quality sleep. Um, Harvard University actually did a study a couple of years ago. Uh, you, you don't have to have gone to Harvard to figure this out, but um, they compared reading a book at bedtime uh, versus reading from an e-reader at bedtime. So what happens when you read a book at bedtime? False. Right? Yeah. And Harvard spent money and time on figuring that out. Friday um, night versus regular. What? Friday night versus regular. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, so you, you read uh, reading a book. And uh, when you have an e-reader, they actually found that it was harder to fall asleep and, and did more difficulty staying asleep. Uh, I personally can attest to the fact that I have a book on my nightstand that I have been reading for three years, um, and I am, I'm still on chapter two. So uh, really, the book does put you to sleep. Uh, you don't need Mellow Chews or uh, Ambien or whatever people are thinking of asleep. Just try opening a book. Um, so these are some of the issues. If our kids have devices in bed, it is impacting their sleep. And sleep is actually one of the greatest predictors of kids achieving their academic and social success. Whatever their abilities are, if they get the right amount of sleep, they are much 
more likely to maximize their potential as opposed to any, any teacher can tell you if a child didn't get a good night's sleep. They see it right away, the way they walk into the room, they're impatient, they're not focused, they look miserable. Uh, so if we can give, there's one thing you walk out of here tonight with, if you want your children to succeed, help them get a good night's sleep. And part of that means making sure that they don't have devices keeping them up. Uh, it's not a surprise, uh, about 75% of kids sleep with their devices within reach, 77% of kids report going to bed late as a result of their technology. So that, that really goes together. Um, I have this picture in here, and there's a professional baseball player with a, uh, uh, a cell phone in the dugout. It reminds me to tell you the story of when I met with the New York Mets. Uh, any Mets fans here? There's always one. It's <laughs> um, okay, right, we won't judge you. Um, I had a meeting with the New York Mets, and uh, I like to tell this story because every time I have an audience and I can start a story with uh, the time I had a meeting with the New York Mets, I will generally take that opportunity to do so. And we were discussing how technology might be impacting player focus, uh, dependence, distraction, etc. They were telling me about one of the players who uh, was taking frequent bathroom breaks during the game. And initially they had a medical concern, uh, until they realized he was updating his Instagram feed. And so when you think about dependence, I mean, you have, when you, if you went to work and there are 45,000 people that open oh, that, so about 15,000 people come <laughs> to watch you work and you're taking frequent bathroom breaks, um, which is really checking your smartphone, that's a high degree of, of dependence, of behavioral dependence. And so it's important to keep that in mind that it's a really powerful draw. Okay, so that's the behavioral realm. The social realm is, uh, is equally impacted by digital technology. We have digital distraction, social dependence, online aggression and cyberbullying. You hear uh, that in the news every so often, miscommunication. You know, you often see things like this, um, the uh, digital disconnection. I, I call it a, re a regression to parallel play, where people are like playing next to each other but not with each other, like uh, what preschoolers do. Um, but although I was watching people as you walked in, you were pretty engaged with one another. I didn't see you so distracted on your devices, so that's, that's a good thing. Um, but UCLA did a study a couple years ago where they measured kids' ability to read facial expressions and social cues, um, which is like the formulation of quality social interactions, uh, eye contact, ear contact, et cetera, the basic communication skills. And um, they gave them these uh, pictures of facial expressions and they asked them to explain what they are. Uh, then they sent them to sleep away camp without any technology, and then they measured it again, right? And what they found was that after only five days without technology, their ability to read facial expressions, social cues, and form meaningful connections vastly improved. It's a fascinating study, because it really teaches us two things. One is digital technology is having a negative impact on the quality of our interactions. Uh, our kids don't know it because they don't have what to, uh, no barometer to, uh, to uh, face it against. But uh, the good news is, is that by separating from technology, you can have better quality uh, interactions, right? So we see that. When do we best connect with our family, our friends, our kids? I was going to say Thanksgiving, but, but Travis works too. Yeah, Travis. When there's no technology, when we're focused on each other, it's qualitatively different. And we have opportunities even during the week to do that. I, in my own home, we do something called going dark for dinner where there's just no technology. It's just 15 minutes a night, but it's really amazing. You find out what your kids are doing at school. And what you're also doing is you're demonstrating that there's a time for technology and there's a time for not technology. And it also helps kids develop um, internal self-control and self-restraint. And this is actually something that um, the research actually compares self-control and restraint to a muscle. And it's something that you can start developing early on as a child. Everyone's familiar with the marshmallow study. Um, they, they put a couple different studies with marshmallows. I guess they were on sale. But um, you can have one marshmallow now or three marshmallows later. And you can tell, like, for self-restraint in kids, if they go for the one marshmallow now, or they put a child in front of a marshmallow and they watch them and say, if they don't touch the marshmallow, like, they start picking pieces off the marshmallow, trying to take some. So these kind of behaviors are things that we can help develop in our children if we model it, and if we help them, even younger kids, no technology at the dinner table, you are helping them develop those skills as well. Uh, when it comes to uh, social communication, uh, it's not just a kid's issue. You know, when you think about making eye contact, 100% is, is too much, right? It's a little creepy, a little weird. You look very comfortable though, so I'm not. I'm gonna step back. Um, so what we find is that in order to make meaningful connections, you wanna make eye contact about 60 to 70% of the time. 
um, and most people that have been observed in recent studies are only making eye contact 30 to 60 percent of the time. So even us as adults, we are not maximizing the social opportunities that we have with friends and, and, uh, and colleagues. When I go out to dinner with friends, we have uh, a group that we go out fairly regularly. We stack the phone in the middle of the table, and whoever grabs their phone first has to pay for dinner. They do that? So what I recommend is, is what I do. I have a friend who's completely addicted to his phone. We invite him every time. And I have to pay for dinner in three years, and he hasn't figured it out. So um, we're doing pretty well with that. So that's, that's a, a strategy. But we as adults, we can model it for our kids. We can find ways um, of uh, promoting more positive social interaction and engagement. Uh, miscommunication, I think we've all been there. We've sent a text to someone or an email, and the person completely misunderstood what we were trying to say or vice versa, we got a text or digital communication to someone else and we completely um, misinterpreted. This really goes back to what Moravian identifies, that 80% of communication is paraverbal. Meaning it's not the words themselves, it's the tone, it's the volume, the intonation, the body language, all the things that are not the words that help us communicate. So this word up here, you're all thinking about it slightly differently. You know, some of you are like, yeah, whatever. Those are the chill people, like, yeah, whatever. Okay. The uptight people here are like, whatever. The angry, whatever, right? All of that is it's the same word. Um, and uh, it really can be, I'll, I'll, I'll prove to you, on a Friday night, after you wash for hamotzi, before you have the bread, you have whole conversations and you don't say a single word. Huh? Uh-huh? No? Yeah? Right? So you're having conversations, you're communicating, um, but you're not saying any words. So the words are really secondary to all that. But in digital communication, we don't uh, have all those powerful pieces. We have emojis which frankly have gotten way too complicated for me. I used to understand the smiley face, the frowny face, um, the surprise face, uh, but now you've got the, the water pouring down the eyes. I'm not sure if that's a happy thing or a sad thing. Any? Yeah. Huh? yeah. So yeah, the emojis are helpful because they convey something, but it's really no, uh, no replacement for actual communication and understanding um, how other people might be interpreting the language that you're sending. And one of the things we want to teach our kids is that when you put something in text, when you share something, you really need to perspective take and how someone else is going to read that. Um, the same group that we were supposed to go out, uh, we were supposed to go out to dinner, we said, oh, you want to go to this restaurant, right? And someone said, okay, I'll take care of booking it, right? I'll make the arrangements. And uh, she responded in our group text, um, it's all booked. <laughs> and we're thinking, like, does that mean it's all booked and we don't have seats, or does that mean it's all booked, she took care of it, right? You can do it. Uh, with kids, we give them the example of uh, the sentence, uh, I, didn't tell, I didn't tell the teacher you were late to class. That can be, in a text, it can be, I didn't tell the teacher you were late to class, or it could be, I didn't tell the teacher you were late to class, or it could be, I didn't tell the teacher you were late to class, or I didn't tell the teacher you were late to class, or I didn't tell the teacher you were late to class, right? So you see where this is going. I don't have to go through the whole thing. But you know, the, the paraverbal tone, the, the, the uh, emphasis, uh, all go into communication. And a lot of the drama that we see happening amongst kids in social media comes from these miscommunications. These miscommunications can evolve into cyberbullying and aggressive uh, behavior. My wife, um, my wife uh, she's a sisterhood president of our shul. And she did a, um, what do you call it when you have uh, vendors and a boutique, thank you. Um, <clears throat> so she, she ran a boutique and she bought a hat for one of my daughters. Uh, now, you have to understand, my wife ran the boutique. She accepted all the vendors. And so she, uh, this was the text back and forth. Hi, it's Hi Shapiro from the White Shoal. Uh, the hat I bought at the sale for the white shawl, at the white shawl, is too small for my daughter. I was wondering if I could exchange it possibly tonight. The response was, I'm sorry that your daughter has a big head. No returns accepted. Good luck. Right? Harsh, right? Um, anyway, <clears throat> so my wife's kind of taken it back. Like, who does she think? She's never coming back, you know. And it turns out she texted the wrong person. Um, but this person, like, I don't know, decided to be obnoxious, I guess, is the best way, or thought they were having fun, but because there wasn't that connectivity or the um, sarcasm, I guess, or the uh, way that you might express it differently in a face to face conversation, uh, it really uh, created a little bit of cyber drama uh, for a little bit, even as adults. And I think we all probably have experienced cyber drama 
to some degree, even as adults. But our kids are, are, are hopeful. I mean, our kids tend to be less disciplined than, than adults. I mean, there are some adults that are pretty not disciplined. But most, you know, so we really want to help our kids utilize uh, media, social media, digital communication in a way that's healthy, that enhances relationships, but is not dependent on it. They need to understand what they're sending out and how that can impact. 11% of kids report being uh, having been the uh, victim of mean or cruel behavior. By the way, all these statistics that I'm quoting is from data that I've collected across uh, North America uh, from Jewish day schools and Shivas um, across North America. And this 11% is basically the same that uh, the, uh, the general population report as well. So cyberbullying, I find that a lot of negative behaviors, um, although we'd like to think that we're immune to many of them, um, behavior is behavior is behavior and it, varies minimal, minimally from community to community. But what we do find is education and oversight really uh, makes a significant difference in promoting positive behavior. So we talked about behavioral, we talked about uh, social. My favorite area is psychological. Um, we see a relationship between overuse of technology, between uh, with anxiety, depression, isolation, addiction. Um, anxiety, I think, is something we can all relate to a little bit. We've all been there where we forgot our cell phone at home, like, and we're like you know, driving on Route 4, and it's like, oh my God, right? And like, you really feel it right here. It's like, oh my gosh, I forgot my cell phone at home. Oh my God, no one, you start panicking, right? Your heart starts being pounded, you can't catch your breath. I forgot my cell phone at home. No one can get in touch with me. Oh my gosh, God. Now, those of us that are moderately well adjusted, it goes from, oh my gosh, I forgot my cell phone at home. No one can get in touch with me. I forgot my cell phone at home. Yeah. <laughs> no one can get in touch with that. <laughs> and then like a calm comes over us, like like pre-1994, like Menucha Sanefesh, and we really, like calm down and it's like, wow, it feels great. I'm not tethered for a few minutes. Um, so, but that anxiety, the more of a, a relationship you have with your device, the more dependent you are on it, the higher your levels of anxiety are, just your, your walking around anxiety, your baseline anxiety. You're tethered uh, and dependent to your device. We all feel it on Shabbat. We put the phone away, there's a calm. The second Shabbat is over, we're like chasing down the phone and it's like not opening fast enough. And it's like, oh, I missed emails or, or whatever. So there was a study that they did on college students, teenagers, and uh, they asked the teens how important their devices are to them. What they found was the kids obviously said, um, you know, my devices are important to me, it enhances my life, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but when they did a basic correlational analysis of it, the higher degree of importance they placed on their devices, right, the more important it was to them, the higher their anxiety was, the lower their levels of subjective well-being, which is just a fancy term for happiness, and also their lower their academic performance. So when we think about technology, it's the relationship with technology. Is it a healthy one? Is it an unhealthy one? Is it enhancing our lives? Is it an intrusion in our lives? And each one of your kids are going to have a different relationship with technology, which is why there's no magic pill. Because each one of your kids are gonna need a slightly different approach to managing their technology or their engagement with technology, which for us as parents just means we're gonna be exhausted for a very long time. It's just how it is. Um, technology is such a challenge today as parents. It just keeps us on our toes at all times. Um, and each one of our kids needs something different. So that's why it's, you can't just say, this is the amount of screen time, this is the device, you will see. By the way, if your kids have uh, social anxiety or anxiety in general, they're more likely to develop an unhealthy relationship with technology. So even my own kids, knowing their personalities and knowing their um, quirks, uh, understanding how their relationship, some kids need more oversight than other kids, uh, and it's important to understand that as well. Um, so how'd that picture get in there again? Uh, uh, in case you forgot, I had a meeting with the Mets. Um, just thought I'd remind you. Um, everybody know, know what this is? Hashtag. Hashtag. Pound signs. Pound yeah. yeah. Number, Number sir. Number, good. Tic tac toe. I was waiting for that one. Yeah. I forget the real name. There's a real name. Uh -uh. Uh, free, mi free microphone. No, no, no. It's not mine. <laughs> it's an octo octothor. But yeah. Um, there's no point. It's an octothor. Um, but what a hashtag is, I always say do people know what hashtags are, but I don't want anyone to be embarrassed if you don't know, so I'll just tell you so you don't feel bad. Uh, a hashtag is basically just a way of filing something online. So um, if you were to say, like, um, if you wanted, like, best lecturer ever, right, you would, like, go hashtag best lecturer ever at Dr. Ellie Shapiro, right? That's what you would 
you can try it at home if you like. Um, it's actually trending right now, so if you want to get on that bandwagon. Um, so hashtags are how we file things online. And um, it's interesting, uh, some people have you know, favorite uh, athletes, favorite sports figures, some people have favorite rabbis, uh, some people have, I have favorite psychologists. That's just how I roll. And my two favorite psychologists are Peterson and Seligman. Uh, they're the founders of the positive psychology movement. Uh, which tends to look at uh, mental health as more of a positive thing, a uh, positive model than an illness model. Um, so I like these guys. So they did a study a few years back called the uh, Positive Journaling Study. And what they did was they would have uh, the experimental group write down five things at the end of every day that they were grateful for, something that they were happy about that happened for them, and then the other group did nothing. And what they found was that the group that would write the positive things uh, were much happier overall than the group that did nothing. In fact, even after they stopped writing positive for up to three months afterwards, their subjective well-being was elevated compared to the average. So what we know is that when we focus on positive things, when we write down positive things, it makes us feel good. And our schema is a positive schema. The flip side is, if we write down negative things and we post negative things, we actually make ourselves miserable. Um, we tend to view the world through a negative lens. So when you think about what people post online, are you more likely, is one more likely to post positive or post negative? What do you think? It's negative, right? Uh, so you, you uh, actually, you know, be, depends on the platform. That's actually true too. Different platforms promote, but people tend to uh, post negative more often than post positive. I'll give you an example. Um, if uh, Delta gets you to your destination on time with your luggage, are you likely to go, hey, shout out, kudos, at Delta, great job, doing your job, getting you there, right? Or if you were four hours delayed, whether it was Delta's fault or not, you know, if the weather, you know, if it's a major snowstorm, you still blame Delta, and your luggage is elsewhere, which are you more likely to post or tweet or comment about? It's generally the negative. We, we tend to uh, post negative. And so they did a study on hashtags, and they compared positive hashtags to negative hashtags, and they found that for every positive hashtag, there were two negatives. So one of the things about technology is that we have the opportunity to post positive things and share positivity, which actually impacts us. Forget the other people you're talking about. It impacts them positively, but also impacts us positively. You can be selfish and focus on positive things to say. The same impulsivity, be impulsive with positivity. Um, but what we tend to do is we tend to be negative and it actually has a negative impact on our schema and our own subjective well-being. And so this is an area as well where we can help our kids both by sharing positive messages versus negative messages um, and modeling for them, like, oh, let's, let's send someone a positive note. Let's, let's tweet something you know, that we're proud of or excited about, et cetera. One school I worked with um, did a hashtag post positively, a school in Los Angeles. And the whole week, the kids would focus on something to say every day that was positive. Um, and so you're teaching the kids that here's an opportunity, um, a very easy opportunity, to uh, share positive things. So um, we actually, in my own ha home, we do something on, on Friday night. We go around the table, um, and we have, it's called Grateful and, um, and Proud. Grateful comes from Peterson and Sogman. Proud comes from, um, from Breslov. Um, my Litvish uh, friends think it's being uh, haughty and it's gaiva, um, but uh, you know, a little bit pasitas in all of us, I think. <laughs> um, so yeah, but going around the table saying something you're grateful for, my kids look forward to it every week. They reflect on something, they reflect on something that they're grateful for and they share it. And it's just, it's a positive experience. Um, it's really cute to see when my, uh, when my oldest was, uh, was 10, he would say things like, uh, research suggests that expressing positive uh, things uh, you know, promotes objective well-being. It's cute to get an 11-year-old to say that. So, um, <clears throat> All right. 70% of kids report, these are the kids we've surveyed, use technology longer than they intended. Okay, so now when you think about your own self-control, it does not feel good. Uh, as much as we get frustrated with our kids where they say they're going to play a video game for you know, 20 minutes and then two hours later they're still playing, um, it doesn't feel good for them. Usually what happens is, um, you know, our kids come home from school, they want to play video games, they can play for 20 minutes. And then it's quiet and we forget about them. And then um, they're in the basement or in the living room or playing, and then you realize, and then you panic. You're like, oh my gosh, I'm the worst parent. Like, she hasn't done homework, they haven't eaten dinner. Done. And then you go and you freak out. You're like, oh my, get off that, didn't you know? You should know better, right? Come on, you're a 10 year old video game, they're not going to stop on their own. Yet, we're going to develop those skills. But um, I just give you one piece of advice the next time this happens, 
um, and you realize that they've been on for two hours, go to them and say, five more minutes. And you'll see that whole dynamic of that, that uh, tension uh, is actually alleviated. Although they usually do say something like, I'm in the middle of a level. Get that one. Right? It's someone, the biggest gift for parents is they can figure out a way to save things in the middle of a level. That would really solve a lot of them. Anyway, so kids don't feel good about their own technology habits. 70% of kids stay on technology longer than they uh, intended. A lot of kids, 60 plus percent, um, try cutting back. They're trying to. Um, I spoke in a school in Boston two weeks ago, and the kids were saying, my parents are soft. They're not, they, don't, they don't set enough limits. And they want to be better in control, but their parents are uh, you know, not supporting them. It was actually interesting, because I got to speak to the kids uh, before I spoke to the parents. So I was actually able to give that feedback to this group of parents. Not you guys, I'm sure you guys are not soft. I'm saying these parents in Boston, not in Boston. Come on. Um, anyway, so um, helping them along with that, in that process. Early exposure to inappropriate websites, graphic violence can result in emotional distress. And it, you know, it, it's pornography, but it's also graphic violence. Um, and there's no filters that are going to protect you from that. You know, every news story, um, even even the Jewish uh, news websites, you, you know, you go there and there's dash cam videos and there's police, uh, you know, uh, vest videos, and it'll have a warning that'll say warning graphic violence. Um, and for most kids, warning graphic violence mean, I'm going to loosely translate, it means click me. <laughs> or so in, in some in some interpretations, click me now. You know, so that's, that's really what that is. So I know filter is going to help you that. We have to teach self-restraint and understanding that. 63% of kids have seen an image or video clip that disturbed them. 63. So it's not just that they saw something you didn't want them to see. It's having a negative psychological impact on their functioning and their well-being. 42% of kids have looked up a website their parents would disapprove of. And 57% uh, of kids have ended up on a website that they're uh, accidentally, that their parents would disapprove of. So these are middle schoolers, these are little kids that are being exposed to things that we certainly don't want them to be exposed to, but also that's having a negative impact on them. So these are some of the psychological challenges that we face. Day to day, uh, kids are impacted their schoolwork, exposure, uh, criminal charges, college, employment, shidduchim, it's like a really big deal, like you post something on Facebook and that could be the end of your children's uh, opportunities if other families don't like what they see. Um, these things uh, have a way of, uh, um, of uh, getting out of control. Uh, but you know, if you uh, you always look at other people online and you see what their digital footprints are. Your digital footprint is actually <clears throat> the residue of what you do online, what you post online, what you share online, and what people say about you online. And I, I wrote an article a few years back that your digital footprint is actually uh, more important than your academic performance because you can get straight A's and you go to the best college, and then you go out for the job, or even before college if you want the scholarship. Everybody's doing cursory social media searches on. Um, applicants, um, and if they see something you don't, they don't like, they're not going to hire you or they're not going to accept you. Um, and it doesn't even have to be something questionable. Let's say you are, um, let's say you love uh, President Trump, or let's say you hate President Trump. Either either side of it works. Um, if you are vocal and post about it frequently, there are going to be times where you might be applying for a job or for an opportunity where someone does a search and someone doesn't share your opinions and they can impact you. And it's okay, everyone is free to share what they want, as long as you recognize what the potential impact is, then you're making a, a decision. Most kids today are not aware that what they put online now can have an impact on them now uh, and in the future. And so it's something to think about, the what is being put online, the pictures that are being uh, put online. Uh, there was a, um, a girl I know of, uh, from my professional experiences, who um, she had when there was she got her email address during bat mitzvah season, so like 11, 12, that age range. And her <coughs> email address was partygirl12, right? Which may work for the bat mitzvah scene, but once you're 18, um, you know, it has different implications. So understanding what you're putting out there online, what the associations are, are critical. Most kids, um, I think today, I know here, they're teaching them a lot about digital citizenship and digital technology, uh, learning about IP addresses and MAC IDs. Everything you do online is traceable, trackable. Uh, we know this because if you, um, you know, look up a pair of shoes, uh, then all of a sudden your email is getting flooded with it, your social media is getting flooded with it, all that same pair of shoes. Um, I remember the first time I figured this out on my own, um, I was uh, redoing my kitchen, and I was looking for an under-counter wine fridge, 
Um, by the way, if you don't buy me the, the Apple Watch, uh, the bottle of wine is also a fine gift. Um, and Amex at that time was doing these weekly deals. They get an email, weekly deal that. And that week, uh, I got an email from them saying uh, there's a special on wine fridges. I'm like, oh my gosh, what has got for this? It's like amazing. <laughs> like, I'm looking for a wine fridge, and right there in my email, this is like you know about eight years ago. So this is, then I figured it out. Um, but really, everything's being tracked. I, I believe, I don't want to sound like a conspiracy theorist, but I also believe that our devices are listening to us, Siri and Alexa. Um, I was having a conversation, we were talking about Purim. Uh, my kids want to dress up as uh, celestial seasonings, different you know, teas. Uh, my son's got the little bear costume for the season time guy. Um, anyway, um, in my Facebook feed, all of a sudden I'm getting pop-up ads for, um, for celestial seasoning. And we didn't do any searches on it. it was just that all of a sudden. I was having a conversation with a friend a little while ago about uh, search engine optimization. So I only know you need search engine optimization. I never said those words before. All of a sudden, I'm getting posts about search engine optimization. So we need to understand our digital footprint is being impacted. There's a file somewhere on us that is being sold, bought, Facebook, etc., cetera, um, as, as what our preferences are with technology. And that all goes into our digital footprint. Um, we see things like uh, this. You're not going to believe what happened when this girl drank a Coke. That's what we call clickbait. Companies want you to click through, and then you have to like, go through a hundred things to actually find out what happened. They generate revenues off of each click. Um, I see some of you want to find out what happened. You want me to click that? Um, so, uh, you know, clickbait. Keep in mind that your, your uh, digital footprint is so critical. Um, I tell the story of uh, last June, Harvard rescinded 10 acceptance letters um, for students that made offensive remarks in a uh, private Facebook group. Think about it, it's a private Facebook group, it wasn't public, and even with that, they were syndicalized. So we have to be so careful. Impulsivity, disinhibition, compulsivity all play into how we act online, and the consequences can be significant. Um, for every negative story, I actually have a positive story. Um, the story of Andrew Feldman. Andrew Feldman, uh, two years ago when he was 14, he went to see uh, Dear Evan Hansen, the Broadway show. Anyone see it? Good, right? Yeah. Um, Dear Evan Hansen, he goes to see the, and he tweets, I met Dear Evan Hansen, it's already awesomer than I expected, oh my god, I'm flipping out. Um, and he goes, thank you, the story, I've never been so overwhelmed by a piece of art in my life, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, Dear Evan Hansen says, and we're so grateful you can hear uh, our story, Andrew, thank you for joining us, you will be found, right? That's their response. So we could say that Andrew Holmes is a nice guy, a positive guy, he's tweeting positive, posting positive, um, probably has a good level of subjective well-being. Again, he's 14 at the time. Two years later, um, recently, I guess, uh, now he's 16, uh, Andrew Feldman was announced as the next Evan Hansen on Broadway. So he's 16 years old, Evan Hansen on Broadway. He just started, I think, about a week or two ago. Um, and what's amazing is I wonder if he had tweeted negatively about Dear Evan Hansen. As he said, you know, a great show, but the choreography was a little weak, or the lighting was a little weak, or whatever. Would the producers have given him the opportunity Clearly he's talented, you know, he didn't just get the part, but would they have given him the opportunity? So what kind of impact could have happened? But thankfully for Andrew, um, he uh, was, was positive. Uh, and I happen to know him, he's a great kid, and he's a positive kid, and, and we see that the impact uh, that positive digital citizenship can have. So as parents, we want to understand the social, psychological, behavioral, um, and day-to-day -day impact. And so when we think about some technology by the numbers, um, these are some of the numbers that you reported to me. Now, I, we're not doing a peer-reviewed journal here, so I'm just going to share some data with you. I'm going to compare your data to what kids report on a national level. So, 75% of you report that there are set rules in the house regarding technology. All right, 75%, not bad, except only 41% of students report that, you know, in their own homes that there are uh, set rules. 78% of you report having conversations about using the internet responsibly. Also, a nice number, 78%. Uh, but only 31% of students say my parents have spoken with me about safe and responsible ways. 27% of parents report that their kids have been disturbed by online images and videos, and we mentioned before 63% of students. So we see a disconnect. There's clearly, a, I don't think parents are dishonest. I just think there's sometimes a disconnect, uh, often a communication disconnect. And um, I, I always, actually, I always felt that this whole public speaking thing didn't work out. I, I would try being a mentalist. You know, mentalist. Yeah. You know. Yeah, like, I know what you're thinking, kind of thing. Like, I'm looking at you, but focus, focus. 
you're thinking, why is he picking on me? Am I correct? No. No. All right. So I'm not even good. All right. So if it's okay, I'd like to do a mentalist exercise with you. Is that okay with you? Sure. All right. I'm going to do it anyway, but thank you. I appreciate the support. Um, all right. So I'm going to ask you a question, and you're going to respond as a group in unison. Okay? Okay. okay. I'm going to ask you a question, you're going to respond as a group in unison. Okay? Okay. 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 I'm going to answer that question, you're going to answer, and we'll see if I have the right answer on the board. Okay? Okay. okay. What's one plus one? Two. Two. Wow. wow. <laughs> you're not so impressed. All right. Let's try another one. Your child comes home from school, and um, you say, how was your day? How was your day? No response. Right. No response. Fine. <laughs> okay. How was your day? Fine. Good, fine. Okay. All right. There we go. Can I get a round of applause? The really good parents in the room will follow up after a good fine um, with, uh, what did you do today? Nothing. Can I get a round of applause? Thank you. So the truth is I am not a mentalist. Um, I actually have no skills in that area, clearly. Um, but this is a conversation that goes on in homes across uh, North America, uh, actually Central America. I spoke in Panama uh, a few months back, and I thought they would say nada, you know, or whatever the Spanish. They said nothing as well. So um, that seems to be the answer. What do you do? Not? And so what that means is we're having these disingenuous conversations with our kids. It's you know, how did your day? What did you do today? Fine, nothing. Uh, can I go play on the Xbox? You know, that's uh, a lot of the conversation. Okay. And in order for us to have more meaningful conversations and to deal with more complicated uh, issues like technology, to know what's going on in their lives. Um, we need to have more meaningful conversations. So the question becomes, uh, what can we do? So we talked about the impact, social, psychological, behavioral, day to day. Um, we see some of the challenges. We have a better understanding, I hope, of, of the challenges. But at the end of the day, what can we do as parents? I'm out of time, so thank you very much. It was great speaking. <laughs> uh, the first thing we need to recognize is that there is no magic doll. Right? We just have to throw that idea out the window. There's no one filter, although I have some recommendations. There's no one age, although it's uh, very much socially driven. But most importantly, we have to seek to find a healthy balance within our home. It doesn't mean banning video games. It means finding a healthy balance. It doesn't mean banning social media. It means finding the balance. It doesn't mean uh, not letting them watch videos. It means finding a healthy balance. And so in order to find that healthy balance, the first thing that we need to do, uh, rule number one, is to have rules. Whatever those rules are. The actual rules, to me, are actually secondary to just having rules. Your children need to know what the parental expectations are. So even in any given house, you could have different expectations. But maybe your rule is no, no devices an hour before bedtime, because we just learned about how sleep is impacted. Or maybe your rule is um, you know, going dark for dinner for 15 minutes. Or maybe your rule is no video games until you do the homework. Or maybe your rule is um, if you're on social media or on uh, internet cable device, the door to your room has to be open. Whatever the rule is, it's important to have these rules because what you're teaching is uh, self-restraint, responsibility, and you're inculcating expectations into your children as it relates to technology use. So having uh, these rules. Only 41% of kids say there are set rules in the house, so we need to up that uh, number. So rule number one, have rules. Rule number two, Discuss the rules. It's it's one thing we have in our mind, you know, and I think all of us, you know, like we, you know, we think we have rules, and but it doesn't mean yelling at your child at midnight, get off the computer already. Right. That's not really a rule. Uh, there may be uh, in advance having a rule, discussing rules. Sometimes we have rules in our head, we haven't communicated it to our kids, and we need to be more transparent with our kids in in, in, in what those rules are. So that's rule two. Rule one, have rules. Rule two, uh, discuss rules. Rule three is actually the hardest one of all. And that's uh, keeping the rules. There are always going to be opportunities for us to uh, not follow through on the rule. And oftentimes it's easier for us as parents to just let them play a video game for a few hours or let them binge on Netflix for a few hours. It, it actually, you know, many times it's easier for us to do that. But if we're not consistent or relatively consistent, we're never going to be 100%. But if we're relatively consistent with the rules, then our children are going to understand the, the priorities and the values that we are inculcating them with technology. And this is really, really one of the most critical pieces. Modeling, communicating, and making sure that we're consistent with it. Our kids, the two, two of the biggest challenges that they have uh, are FOMO. We talked about that, the fear of missing out, and BED. Does everybody know what BED stands for? Mm -hmm. oh, It's not bad, it's not such a um, It's actually what everyone has. 
I think that's one of the biggest challenges that we have as parents is the social norms and the social pressures to either get them a device or to get them a phone or to get them Snapchat or to get them Fortnite. That is uh, a lot of the pressure that we face. And so one of the things that I recommend to parents um, is to influence those social norms. Although our kids, I, I often say our kids are like monkeys. Um, and it's not because I don't like kids, it's just because I really, really like monkeys. Monkeys are really cute. Um, but let me show you this video. I think it's self explanatory. So, a final experiment that I want to mention to you is our fairness study. Uh, and so this, the, the, this became a very famous study, and there's now many more, because after we did this about 10 years ago, uh, it became uh, very well known. And we did that originally with capuchin monkeys, and I'm going to show you the first experiment that we did. It has now been done with dogs, and with birds, and with chimpanzees, um, with, but with Sarah Brosnan, who started out with capuchin monkeys. And there's a very simple task that they need to do, and if you give both of them cucumber, for the task, the two monkeys side by side, they're perfectly willing to do this 25 times in a row. So cucumber, even though it's really only water in my opinion, but cucumber is perfectly fine for them. Now if you give the partner grapes, the, the, the food preferences of my capuchin monkeys correspond exactly with the prices in the supermarket. <laughs> and so if you give them grapes, it's a far better food, uh, then you create inequity between them. So that's the experiment we did. Recently, we videotaped it with new monkeys who had never done the task, thinking that maybe they would have a stronger reaction, and that turned out to be right. The one on the left is the monkey who gets cucumber. The one on the right is the one who gets grapes. The one who gets cucumber, note that the first piece of cucumber is perfectly fine. The first piece she eats. Uh, then she sees the other one getting grape, and you will see what happens. So she gives a rock to us, that's the task. And we give her a piece of cucumber, and she eats it. The other one needs to give a rock to us, and that's what she does, and she gets a grape, and she eats it. The other one sees that, she gives a rock to us now, gets again cucumber. Street protested, you see, 